over the last 12 months have worked very closely with the PEO to ensure that we that we keep LCS headed fair in the channel, that we get them, keep the mission modules headed fair in the channel, and that we keep it rolling. And they do superb work for you, for us, every single day. Tate Westbrook back there recently reported from uh, Joe Malloy's front office where he was working uh, over at FMB. Now he's the, uh, he's the assistant programmer. And, uh, and his FM chops are undeniable and gives us great, uh, great um, uh, uh, support every single day. Um, Let's see, where's, uh, where's Dave McFarland? Dave McFarland back there in the back. Dave McFarland took over as a deputy in OpNav N96. With some uh, reductions in flag officers, Ron Boxel took off and, uh, and departed. Uh, he's down on the J5 on the joint staff. Dave fleeted it up from the assistant programmer to the deputy. Dave does absolutely superb work for us, and I couldn't get it done without him. Robert Tortora and Craig Fajardin, they do um, uh, uh, training and... It gives me just a short journey to recognize them to the Pacific. And how does this all, and have we got our priorities in 96 in order, to be able, in order to be able to take advantage of this time here? I think about the time that I spent when, when we would get Bunker Hill underway and we would steam out of Tokyo 1, and as we went by the sea buoy within two hours, we were being flown on by the Soviets every single day. We'd go through Tsushima or we'd go through Sugaro. It didn't make a darn bit of difference, but we were going to get flown on every day. We worked on the inner screen, on the ASW inner screen, every single day. And we had to be good. We had to be good because it was right there. It was right there for us. We had to work on the inner screen. We had to defend the carrier. It was midway. We had to defend the carrier. We had to, we had to intercept and escort at 125. And we were running cap stations at 125 and doing intercepts at 150. Those were the good old days. Reeves was out on picket. We were in close. We had four, five, six ships around Midway getting it done. Air defense, the inner screen, and the war and sea. It was our bread and butter then, and it is our bread and butter now. It is core to surface warfare. It is what we do. But 89 rolls around. The Berlin Wall comes down. The Soviet Union is dissolved. We get involved in different kinds of wars, in different ty types of conflicts. We are really into power projection. And the challenge on the sea, the challenge to sea control is not there. We have unfettered access to all of the oceans. The enemy's gone. The Soviet Union is tied up. Or the Soviet Navy is tied up. And the Soviet Union is dissolved. And we get, into some, we get into the first Gulf War, and the first Gulf War is about, it is about power projection. And I tell you what, we got absolutely phenomenal at, at strike. You want a tomahawk at this latitude and longitude, at this time, you're going to get that tomahawk. You want a hundred of them, you're going to get a hundred of them. We took SSBNs and we turned them into SSGNs. Strike. You want, you want sorties off the aircraft carrier? You're going to get sorties off the aircraft carrier, and you are going to get ordnance on target. And think about those sorties that were coming off the, that aircraft carrier. Where was the screen? Where was the challenge to the aircraft carrier? Where was the threat? There was no threat. We would operate routinely, sometimes with zero escorts with the, the aircraft carrier, most of the time with one, certainly some playing guard at night. Unchallenged. Unchallenged. I remember when I deployed on Milius in the 2000 time frame. My sonar techs, my wonderful, beautiful, amazing sonar techs, manned the 50 cows as we went through the Strait of Hormuz. Is the emphasis on the inner screen? Is the emphasis on on defending our high value assets is the emphasis on ensuring that we control the sea. 
We control the sea in the United States Navy and core within surface warfare. We, can, we, we execute the war at sea. We execute uh, the, the, the inner screen. We protect the aircraft carrier. We protect, protect and we enable the ability to project power and we execute air defense. Not that those have taken a back seat and not that those have, that, that means that we have gone away from those, but we haven't had to concentrate them on them with a significant amount of our gray matter. Well, look at the quote from, from President Kennedy. Control of the seas means security. Control of the seas means peace. Control of the seas can mean victory. The United States must control the seas if it is to protect our security. So as we got together in N96 and we, and, 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 and we looked at this at a course correction and we started to leverage the gains that we had been made, especially in our number one priority, which was to make stuff work, make the stuff we have today work, working on the maintenance side of the house, Erica Plath and Tom Sissiolo, working with fleet maintenance officers, working with the type commanders, working with our um, um, uh, Naval Sea Systems Command. We started driving down a path that gives us a well-defined requirement that we can defend and we can fund. And we're driving in a direction that's going to allow us to be able to ensure the maintenance of our ships, ensure that we can get them to their expected service site, ensure that we can drive them into their midlife availabilities or whenever the modernization availability occurs for them. Tremendous, tremendous work, not only on their part, but on the part of the TICOMs, on the part of the fleets, and on the part of, and the part of Naval Sea Systems Command. And Admiral Dave Gale working over at C-21, and prior to him, Admiral Jim Shannon. Superb work, superb work working relationship. We were able to leverage the work we've done to get a well-defined requirement for training and to get the funding executed. That doesn't mean we needed to put that away, but we needed to shift around our priorities slightly, provide a slight course correction. So this is where we're going. The third priority, is, which is still there, is to make the stuff we have today work. We've got to keep our eye on the ball with respect to maintenance, with respect to training, with respect to manpower, with respect to the, with respect to the, the support that we provide to achieve that current readiness. And I would also submit to you, when you see that uh, getting LCS to the fleet has, has, has not fallen off the page, it is right there in making the stuff we have today work. We deployed LCS, we brought her home under a new manning concept, a new training concept, a new uh, maintenance concept, a new employment concept. We flew a crew over there, and that crew turned over, and two days later, that crew was underway. The entire crew. The first time in the history of the United States Navy that we were able to do that. And we proved that we can do that. We're going to do it again with Fort Worth in the latter part of this year. That's where LCS fits into this. Building to the future, I'm going to talk a little bit later about building to the future. We've done a lot of work this year in order to get to where it is we need to be to understand how we can build ships affordably, how we can upgrade them affordably, and how we can get them to their expected service life. And the number one priority, really, is, and it's about controlling the sea, about what President Kennedy talked about, about, our, about resourcing our ability to do sea control, because air and missile defense, integrated air and missile defense, the inner screen, and, um, and the war at sea, offensive ASUW, clearly, squarely, in the wheelhouse of surface warfare. Go to the next slide. So this is the programmatic slide that I have for, the, for you today. In the past, I've, talked, I've gone through a lot of our uh, programs. I'm just going to talk briefly about these, but I can tell you that between Charlie Williams, between Jim Kilby, between the maintenance side of the house, between Dave Welch, we've got everybody clearly and squarely focused on making sure that, from, that the entire kill chain that Vice Admiral Copeland referred to, we've got that covered from soup to nuts in executing these capabilities, in, in ensuring in ensuring that as we continue to operate in those contested, as, as the waters of the future become more contested, whether it's the Western Pacific, whether it's the North Arabian Sea, or whether it's the Eastern Mediterranean, that when they say, hey, you've got to, def you've got to defend the high value unit and the inner screen and defining the inner screen, which is growing right now, given the range of weapons that we're seeing out there from some of the undersea threats, that people aren't saying, well, what are we talking about here? Nope. We are responsible for making sure that the QQ-89 AV system, AV-15 system, which is the premier sub-hunting system that we have, and it is, it is per performing phenomenally, that we have the training in place, that we have the training for the manpower in place, and that we have the training for the operation of the system in place and incorporating it into the larger picture of ensuring that we can defend the aircraft carrier always because that is our purview. 
on the ASUW side of the house, a lot of work is being done on here. On the ASUW side of the house and on Harpoon. People say Harpoon, 65-mile missile. Harpoon is a very, very, very capable weapon. And I am absolutely convinced that we, could, that we have good years left on that weapon. But we have, to, we have to move further. We have some unique partnerships that we've developed as a, as a result of trying to drive this down the road. One of them is OSD's Strategic Capabilities Office. Doing a lot of work with them, getting a lot of assist assistance from OSD strategic capabilities in order to be able to ensure that as we move forward into the future, we've got ASUW and we've got the war at C wired. I'll talk a little bit more about DDG 1000 in a little bit. We've got Flight 3 DDG coming online, second ship in 16. This is going to be a Flight 3 DDG. It's going to have the Air Missile Defense Radar. Prior to that, and as we roll out the Advanced Capability Build 12, which is on Tech Insertion 12 which is baseline nine for our Aegis weapon system, which is, is going to allow us to execute Navy integrated fire control counter air, which is a phenomenal, phenomenal capability. We're testing it out and we're building the concept of operations. We've got the crew of Normandy, which is going to deploy with the Theodore Roosevelt Battle Group, locked and loaded in order to be able to ensure that when we deploy Navy integrated fire control counter, we can use the Santa Missile 6, which is really the, one of the centerpieces of Navy Integrated Fire Control Counter Air to the maximum extent of, it, of its capability. We are delivering phenomenal, phenomenal capability, and we need to be ready for it. And so as we sat back, our team in N96 and said, okay, have we got it right? Do we need to make some corrections? When it becomes about controlling the sea, and, and I do find it interesting that you hear a term anti-access area denial talked about quite frequently now, but I don't think that the anti-access area denial that we're experiencing today is really any different than some of the anti-access area denial threats that we, that we experienced back in the 70s and 80s. But this is clearly, clearly our wheelhouse. So we're going to continue to ensure that we have the entire readiness kill chain squared away and properly resourced in order to get these capabilities to the fleet, get them in the hands of our sailors, and make sure that they can operate them and operate them properly as we move towards having to ensure, or as we ensure that we continue to be able to control the sea. Next slide. The outlook for surface warfare, DDG-1000 in the, in the water up in Bath Ironworks last year, the latter part of last year, tremendous, tremendous capability. A lot of new technology going into the ship. Integrated power, uh, electronic uh, uh, module enclosures on this ship, uh, long-range land attack projectile, uh, Mark 57 PVLS, a lot of new technology. We're going to learn a lot. And if this, if this ship right here is, is, is achieved 75% of what it's touted to have, and I, and I fully expect it to achieve 100%, it is going to be a, a force multiplier for our, for our fleet commanders and for our combatant commanders as we get it out there. We've got some, we've got some work to do to get it out, no doubt about that. But, uh, but I am confident we've got the, the right team on the ship in order to be able to um, uh, 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 get it out there and get it operating. Flight 3 DDG, uh, up gun to 4160, 4,160 volt buses in order to be able to uh, support the, uh, the installation of the air missile defense radar. And as I said, it will be coming out in the second, um, the second ship in 16 will be the first AMDR ship. Uh, you heard uh, Vice Admiral Copeland talk about the littoral combat ships and where we are on that. A superb deployment. We're going to go to IOC on the SUW mission package this year. We're going to go to IOC on the, on the uh, minesweeping package uh, in the 15 time frame and in the 16 time frame that uh, ASW package that, uh, that Vice Admiral Copeland uh, referred to earlier will be IOC in that, uh, in that particular year. Where we're driving into the future, if we go to the next slide, the future surface combatant. A lot of work. I, I talked last year about scalability, flexibility, modularity. And I, and I formulated that into, in my a tip of the hat to the USNI and proceedings for, uh, for publishing uh, the, the article that, I, uh, that uh, we wrote in OPNAV N96 about, about where we're going with respect to our future ships. I think it is about integrated power on the right size ship. I think it is about the right weapon systems. I think it's about affordability, affordability, affordability. I think it's about ensuring that as we lay the ship down and we get the ship out to the fleet, that we have a good uh, plan in mind to ensure that the weapon systems 
pace the threat throughout the life of the ship. I think we have to think about the capability that we build into those ships. We've been building multi-mission ships, our guided missile destroyers and our cruisers. Are we still headed down a path that's going to that's going to drive us to a multi-mission ship, or are we looking at preferencing one mission area over another on the ships that we build? And, and, and I'm thinking about as I think about directed energy and these other and these other technologies that we're going to build into these ships. I'm talking about moving into the latter part of the 20s, where we're going to start contracting for these in order to be able to replace our cruisers that are going to be retiring in the 30s time frame. A lot of great work. We did a we did a war room effort. Um, in the mid part of last year and partnering with OPNAV N81, the assessments division on the OPNAV staff, we have, uh, we have driven to um, uh, a, uh, a, a, um, uh, a study on how we're going to get to these capabilities. So we're going to be calling through that and ensuring that, uh, that uh, we have a roadmap to get to these uh, future surface combatant uh, in the 20s time frame. Next slide. So uh, rapid... Um, I'll wrap it up now and turn it over to my battle buddy, uh, General Walsh, but uh, I'll leave you with a couple thoughts. Um, I think our, our, our third priority, which is still high on my list, flows into the second, which flows into the first, supporting that rebalance to the Pacific, ensuring that we're resourcing pro properly, which really supports the, the CNO's number one tenet of war fighting first. When I was in command of, uh, of, the, of the Nimitz strike group, I used to go on board the... the uh, the destroyers and the cruisers and into the ready rooms and the squadrons. And I used to talk to them about, um, about the choice that we are faced with as we step into a position of responsibility. Whether it's in command of a squadron, whether it's in a department head on a ship, whether it's a, a leading chief petty officer in a division, and that is the choice that we are faced with respect, to, with respect to whether or not we are going to be good or whether we are going to try to get lucky. Now, and I, would, and I would say to them, we in the strike group have to do everything we can to be as good as we can possibly be. Because we are, there is an element of luck associated with going to sea. And what we are focused on in OPNAV N96 is to ensure that our, in our resourcing, in our requirements, in our support to the type commander, in our support to the fleet, in our support to our fellow resource sponsors, that we are as good as we can possibly be. So as we drive towards this war fighting first, as we drive towards the sea control, as we drive towards these things that lay clearly in the wheelhouse of surface warfare, we are as good as we can possibly be. If we do that, we're going to be, continue to head on a, a great path uh, to the future. I look forward to your questions at the end. We'll try to um, – I think I'm right on time. I'll turn it over to Whaler Watch. I think i got one more. And uh, I think that's attributed to um, – uh, uh, to Thomas Jefferson, but uh, we're going to continue to work pretty darn hard in OPNAV N96 so we can be as lucky as we possibly can be. Okay? So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. With that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to my shipmate and friend, General uh, Whaler Walsh. All right. Well, thanks, Tom. Admiral McCullough, thank you very much. And to the Surface Naval uh, Association, appreciate this opportunity to kind of tell you our story a little bit on the amphib and the mine warfare side. The other thing, too, is we've got a great team on uh, N95 that works amphib ships. We work mine warfare. We also work the uh, Naval Expeditionary uh, Combat Enterprise. So those are the three pieces. We're very close with Tom's team over at uh, 96. Uh, try to align as, as best we can uh, with the same processes in place. Uh, working with Admiral Copeman and his team to try to keep these things tight and aligned to keep moving forward. Um, from a resource sponsor standpoint, uh, one of the things I think that we focus on is that balance between current readiness and future readiness. On Admiral Copeman's team of Surface Warfare Enterprise, uh, Admiral Gubitau, Tau, Pete's got the future readiness piece. Tom and I balance that future readiness. But we also have the money on the, uh, the, you know, the manpower, the training, the, uh, the maintenance dollars that come into us and trying to balance that piece. So we have those resources up there and trying to always look at, at what the fleet needs up there to try to balance where Tom's projecting, where we're trying to project out into the future with what the current fleet needs and what they're trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a real challenge in this budget environment that we're in, but, uh, but we're working hard to try to work that. Next slide. I think the, uh, the Secretary hit on this pretty well. Um, 
the world today isn't getting any nicer, and I don't think there's any peace dividend. So if you look at it is what he's talking about, you can go right to the next slide and talk about um, Ford Presence. And he touched base on this, on the Navy, the Marine Corps team, and what Ford Presence means to that team of being Ford uh, deployed in, uh, and, and being out there all the time. The strategic value that we bring for our national interest. And I don't think there's any question about that. As we come out of Iraq, we come out of Afghanistan, uh, looking at that, we're not garrisoning. We're going to continue to stay as a strong Navy Marine Corps team for deployed, uh, meeting our, our, our interest. And being able to do that for forward presence, but also being able to scale up. So if I talk about the, uh, the AMFIB fleet here just for a second and what the AMFIBs really do forward, I think if you look at phase zero, phase one, those operations, we don't get a lot of credit a lot of times for what we do in that area. We talk a lot about major conventional operations, what the blue kill chain can do with the red kill chain and that. But if you take a look around the globe today, our partners that we've got out there work in those phase zero, phase one operations that the surface fleet um, the entire Navy, four deployed, and the entire Marine Corps team. But your amphibs being out there with that blue-green team that can really reach out there and build relationships, build partnerships. Uh, those are the alliances that hopefully prevent conflict. And uh, they're out there doing that every single day. And I think as you, as you look at those at that amphib force, it's certainly that Swiss Army knife to be able to get out there and do phase zero all the way on up to major conventional operations. And I think, you know, I think uh, the times here are very right for that Navy and Marine Corps team to be forward deployed uh, doing all the things the, uh, the Navy and Marines do forward. Next slide, please. I kind of wanted to show you this. This is kind of where we're trying to head. As, as Tom talked about rebalancing to the Pacific, a key part of that rebalancing to the Pacific is we have always had our ARGMU-4 deployed in Japan. That's going to continue to be a constant for us. We've also had um, an ARG that's always been uh, in the CENTCOM AOR. That are we expect to be continuously deployed. That's kind of our requirement to be able to man those those two deployments. But there's a lot of other demands, and as I had on that first slide, kind of a uh, a nasty, dangerous world we're in. Not only are we in this rebalance to the Pacific, but we also have this new normal that's going on across the globe in trying to stay actively uh, engaged, trying to prevent conflict in those areas. The one that you see in the med there, the Special Purpose MAGTAF Crisis Response, uh, that was really the Marine Corps answer to the joint requirement to be able to have a crisis response force in the Mediterranean. Many of you old salts that are in here today would remember the days of the ARG uh, 4 deployed, the Mu 4 deployed in, in the, uh, the Mediterranean. We don't have the luxury. We don't have enough ships to be able to do that today with that requirement. So that special purpose MAGTAF is forward, and it's not on ships. We'd like it to be on ships. You also see down off the, uh, the coast there of, uh, of Africa, down f further south there in the Gulf of Guinea down there, a presence down there that we'd like with the, uh, the new normal that we've got today. Uh, so being able to try to get uh, independent steamers, uh, ships that could deploy on there, we're working. Going back to the Pacific, uh, we've got Marines that are shifting out of uh, Japan as we rebalance the Pacific. We've got Marines down in uh, Darwin, Australia right now today uh, operating there. Uh, along with as we rebalance and move forces out of uh, Japan down to Guam as part of that rebalance, putting Marine MAGTAF there. So trying to get those Marines to see, those sailors to see, to support that is going to be a critical goal in that area. So that's kind of one of the challenges we've got is trying to uh, ensure that we keep that, uh, that uh, piece up. One of the things that we've done with our ARGs and MUSE, the group sail, those days we now disaggregate. We do split ARG ops. Uh, we are constantly taking our MUSE, our ARGs, splitting them along, sometimes into different uh, COCOM AORs to try to gain as much presence as we can. Next slide. This is kind of the, uh, the demand that we see in the, uh, in, if you look at the AMFIB fleet. If you look at the core capabilities of the, the Navy, there's no surprise that demand on our AMFIB fleet is high. And you can see it's high across the Navy. But I just look at, you can kind of see some of the, uh, the sourcing requirements we've had. COCOM demand to get, uh, you know, AMFIBs forward has been uh, very high. And we continue to try to struggle to meet that, uh, that demand. Next slide. 
Uh, one of the things that uh, that we find, you know, I was down at Quantico working down there on the uh, the Marine side, and now up at uh, N95, is we deal a lot with a lot of foreign nations and a lot of foreign nations, navies, uh, Marine, and Army, uh, a lot. We had a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, discussions with a lot of armies across the world because they, quite a matter of fact, look a lot, uh, try to think of themselves a lot more like a MAGTAF, trying that we're smaller, we integrate, we task organize, and sometimes I think they can relate to us. Uh, in, in how we organize. And the same thing with the, uh, the fleet is uh, what we're seeing here is a lot of countries around the globe expanding their amphib force um, and growing the amphib force uh, throughout the globe. And that gives us a lot of opportunity. I think if you go back to that piece I was talking about of building relationships, building partnerships, uh, that gives us that opportunity there to work together as Navy, uh, as, as uh, teammates there to build those relationships and partner in a lot of different areas. So I think that's a, a key piece here is, is this area here, more and more opportunities to work with partner nations around the globe in many different areas. Uh, all the way from the, uh, the lower end on humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, all the way up on some of our major fleet exercises that work with some of our, uh, our large-scale amphibious landings. Next slide. The amphib uh, ship numbers here you'll see is uh, the requirement we've had over the years is to have uh, uh, 38 ships is our requirement to do our 2.0 MEB uh, assault echelon capability. But uh, we also see that matches up pretty well with uh, our amphib force requirements. But we've, we've looked at that and said, hey, we're going to uh, acknowledge the fact that, that during the fiscal constraints that we've got the 33 is the number. And that's the number that we're kind of working to and uh, striving for. And you can see here um, with the ships that we've got coming online, particularly the LXR, uh, we'll be able to get that, uh, meet that requirement out there in 25. So what you'll see, see from that is we don't have enough ships. The United States Navy doesn't have enough ships. We heard the Secretary of Navy there. So the key part here is maintaining the ships we've got, the readiness we've got, as we keep these procurement uh, plans on path, as we try to keep that uh, force coming online. Next slide. No question that the ARGNU is our centerpiece. This continues to be our centerpiece as we go forward. Uh, it comes with an enormous capability. You can kind of look at this. And, and I found it interesting when I first kind of got here and, uh, and heard the surface community and the CNO talk about platforms and payloads. Uh, and I don't think that, you know, for, for the AMFIB fleet, for the ARGU commanders, that's exactly what, uh, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Platforms and payloads, I think, is right in line with where the CNO is trying to take us, and it's right in line with what we're doing. All that gear, all that equipment, every time these ARGMUs to sail and deploy, they take a look at what the mission is, how they should task organize their, their gear, their equipment, their troops, and they put it on those platforms in the right way. Are they going to steam independently or going to stay together as a group? And they organize themselves that way. So I think uh, where we're headed uh, with the ARG as a centerpiece, but the ability to, uh, to shift gears, do split ARGOPS, maintain the C2 requirements that we need in there is going to be very critical as we go forward. Next slide. One of the things that uh, we had was in uh, Bold Alligator 12. If you think about uh, where we've been over the last few years after 9-11, we had not really done a major amphibious operation exercise um, really since prior to then. And in Bold Alligator 12, we brought the fleet together off the East Coast. Uh, we do that on the East Coast, and we also do it on the West Coast with Dawn Blitz. We brought those ships together, the Marines together, in uh, Bold Alligator for the first time in over, over a decade. And uh, we did it, and I would tell you, surprisingly, the lessons learned were good. But I think that the, uh, the, the old salts again in here, I think, would be proud. A lot of this stuff came together. But now we are looking at new gear, new equipment. How do you use them? We start looking at capabilities like Ospreys being able to go way deep inland in uh, maneuver warfare. Those were new things that we had, new capabilities. How do we use those? So I think as, as the CNO went out there to get the, uh, the after action and the, the debrief on there, uh, one of the things that I think he highlighted was things had changed. The C2 capabilities needed to be improved in the, uh, the amphib ships. In fact, we've heard the CNO talk 
talk about one of the things he says is, you know, the Marines came aboard after Iraq and Afghanistan and they had their stick in their hand and said, where do I plug this in? And he said, well, you plug it into that three-plong plug over there on the wall. And that's kind of really where you're at with uh, where we've gone. If you kind of take a look at the Marine Corps, you know, really kind of working hard in Iraq, Afghanistan, constantly upgrading our C2 capabilities over the year. When I walk aboard WASP in uh, Bold Alligator and look in the LFOC and you go, yeah, I feel comfortable in here. This is what I'm used to in a regimental COC or a division COC or an ACOC. You kind of look at that and go, this is all the high-tech stuff I expect. You walk over on the other side into the uh, in the Navy side of their, their uh, command operations. You look at and you look around and go, boy, I feel like I'm back in the 70s, and uh, and that's what I think the CO saw in there that we got a lot of work to be done in the C2 to make sure that we're interoperable in that C2 capability, but also to make sure that we can talk to the rest of the joint force and the rest of the battle force. So he gave us that task to really start getting after C2 with us, the N2 N6. Is the, is the resource sponsor along with us to really get after that. So what we've done is the Marine Corps had a pretty good process in place with a, a requirements letter that they would send forward from Quantico every year with the Marine Corps requirements. And we weren't getting that really on the, uh, the Navy side. So Fleet Forces Command now is giving us those requirements. And we're bringing those forward in what we call now the amphibious and advanced naval amphibious baseline to be able to get all the stakeholders together to be able to integrate the requirements of the Marine Corps and the Navy, to make sure they talk back and forth, to make sure we're integrating the new capabilities that are going on across the fleet, uh, along with configuration management, and trying to make sure we prioritize that right across the two services and integrate so we've got the right priorities. Palm 16 is the first time we're doing that right now, and I think there's really a lot of opportunity here to use the right resources in the right way to get after that. Next slide. This is one I think uh, is uh, what Admiral Copeman was was talking about. Tom touched on that also. Is many of you have uh, have looked at the Bilal report and and where the surface force was to look at where we could get better, and and I think there was a lot of tremendous good work in that report. I think there were 36 integrated recommendations that came out of that report, and then since then, all of you, many of you in here. Uh, over the last uh, several years have been doing just tremendous work taking that report, trying to figure out where do we get better. Uh, we talked, Admiral Copen talked about the PESTO, the different pillars that we've got to kind of line up as lines of operation with lines of effort below that. And that key part there is, is you kind of crosswalk those things that we've kind of identified that needed work into the processes that need to be put in place. You can kind of look at that across there, and I will tell you, there has been some great work done in that area, and, and I think we are on the right path to really kind of drive home the best amount of readiness we can get in the fleet uh, using the budgets that we've got. We have to do that. There's no question about that. We can't have efficiencies. As I talk to our guys, we need to have a culture of affordability, but we have to question every requirement. Everything that comes up, we have to question, we have to watch to make sure we're spending it in the right way. And so this piece here, I know the processes are in place. The Surface Warfare Enterprise has this. And I think the key thing now is it's going to take some time for it to work, but we really need to develop, which we're in the process of doing across the, the Surface Warfare Enterprise, of getting those metrics in place to really set those standards and define where those metrics are and now track the task. Break down those barriers, really find where, why are those yard availabilities, why are we coming out late on the backside all the time, not getting the work done and spending too much money on our end. So trying to drill into that and really take this down to that readiness kill chain approach, I think is one of the things that, you know, in the next year, we're going to be really teamed up really close with Admiral Copeman on this to make sure that we drive towards that with all the other stakeholders in here. Next slide. Next slide. Just kind of a quick look through our programs here as I look at this is the, uh, the, the exciting time in the, I think, in the Amphib Force. LHA 6 America. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Dave Lewis is in here, Admiral Lewis, but uh, tremendous job these guys have been doing on this program. Uh, finished its uh, um, builder's trials, getting ready to do, do acceptance trials. We're going to take this ship at the end of March, and this is going to be a quantum leap in capability. When you get a war, capital warship like this out there with the, uh, the capabilities that the Marines are going to be bringing out there with uh, 
you know, the MV-22s that we have today, along with the Joint Strike Fighter, uh, that's going to be just a tremendous capability. When you think about the Joint Strike Fighter, and I know this is Surface uh, Naval Association, but that aircraft, the reason the Marines really want that aircraft is not for its ability to do close air support over the battlefield. That's a given. But that thing is an air combat system sensor that can bring in information uh, like no other aircraft out there today and in the future with the processing capability and growth capability that's just going to be phenomenal. To be able to connect that into the battle force, not just to the Marines on that ship, but into the battle force, to be able to tie in with the carrier battle groups, to be able to tie in with Tom shooters on the ships, and be able to pass that information, be part of that NIFCA approach. I think that's going to be the exciting part of, yep, there will be times when that ship will be out there supporting Marines. There will be other times where it's out there as part of the Naval Task Force, supporting the Joint Force Commander and that Naval Task Force Commander with those great capabilities it's going to bring to the fight. We can't afford to do it any other way with that capability that we're going to be bringing to that ship. Um, and in, in three years, we're going to have the first F-35 squadron, four deployed in the Pacific on a big deck amphib. So it will be the first ship, first Navy warship, first warship anywhere, that's going to have an F-35 fifth generation capability on a ship deployed, four deployed. And we need to use that right. Next slide. The San Antonio class. Um, what I would say about this is the sailors and the Marines love this ship. Uh, the Marines can't get enough of this ship. The C2 capabilities are the best capability that we've got out there in the amphib force right now. Uh, and I tell you, you know, just like any platform coming in, when it's new, you're going to go through some growing pains. We've got 10 deployments under this ship right now, and it's, uh, it's gotten through those growing pains. And we're doing a phenomenal job. The Somerset that just went through its uh, acceptance trials, zero star cards on that ship. So you surface uh, warfare officers that understand, that's pretty damn good. It's pretty damn good, and, uh, and not only that is it doing well in that role, but it's doing just an absolutely phenomenal role out there on, you know, out there supporting the joint force, and like I said, is an independent capability to steam away from the big deck, absolutely has a C2 capability and the capabilities to go with it. So that's an exciting story. Next slide. The LXR. This is exciting, too. Uh, how often do we have a time to change, to take and mold and shape a new ship's capability? Uh, and we've got that right now with our LSD replacement, the LXR. So we want to make sure we get this right. There's a real opportunity here to do that right. And as we're going through our, uh, our AOA analysis of alternatives right now, we're really taking a real hard look on what are the range of capabilities, what are the options we need, and really try to drive in affordability into that ship. That is a key thing we've got to do. And one of the things that we've done is uh, we've brought the industry teams together to really work this with us, trying to do some of that critical design work early up front, not later on, early on, to try to drive all the way down to the subsystem level, try to drive those costs down early on to get the most affordable ship with the most capability. And, and that's another one. We have to do that. If we don't do it right, we'll get less capability, and, uh, and we don't want to do that because we certainly have done a good job with the America class coming on and certainly with the San Antonio class. We want to do the same thing with this capability here. So clear direction from the CNO, clear direction from uh, SECNAV and the Commandant, working together very close, trying to make sure we've got the requirements right. In fact, I think it's uh, next week. We've got fleet coming together down in Norfolk along with the Marines, to be able to look at what are the capabilities and try to look at those cost trades in the capabilities and many different capabilities we set and kind of take a look at that and go, what do we really want on this ship in kind of a war game approach to see where are those cost trades if we try to bring uh, costs down. Next slide. The LCACs and the LCUs. Uh, these are connectors. You've got a landing force, you've got the ships, and you got to get them to the beach. If not, you're going to get entangled, and you're never going to get ashore, and you don't want to have to have to rely on, on piers to get the Marines ashore. So this is our way to do it. We looked at bringing the two together into one platform. It got too hard, too expensive. We stopped, backed up, and said, what do we really need here? The fleet got together. We looked at that real hard and said, we need more LCACs and more LCUs. We, both, we need both those capabilities. They're not separate. They do separate capabilities. And what we're doing is we're going to um, really uh, design the LCAC. We've got, uh, I think, nine on contract right now. We're going to start building them this year. And we're going through the analysis of alternatives on the LCU. Not looking for anything fancy. We're replacing pretty much what we have right now, keeping costs down because they're, they're uh, effective, and it's exactly what, uh, what we need. 
Next slide. The Mine uh, Countermeasures Mission, tying in very closely, working hand in hand with Tom, we work the mission systems, Tom works the mission modules on the LCS. Key piece here on these ships is this is a very complicated piece. If you look at the legacy force and the demands out there in Fifth Fleet, we've done, I think, a fairly good job of getting upgrades to what's out there right now today to make sure Fifth Fleet has what it needs. We're also bringing out from industry bridging capabilities that are improving the capability that they've got out there. But at the same time, we're migrating to the future force with LCS, with the mine uh, uh, countermeasures mission package. That's the future. That's where we're heading, payloads, packages. That's where we need to go. I think I saw Brian Antonio, Admiral Antonio, in here earlier. He's got our full support to move this forward. CNO's got us pushing any piece of equipment capability in there forward because there's a lot of good things that are going on in these mission packages, but there's a lot of pieces coming together. Trying to take as much of that and push that forward as we can is, uh, is what we're trying to do. Very challenging area. You can just look at the slide and see all the moving parts in there and the challenges that go with that in a period of austerity. So we're shifting gears and really focusing out there to that future piece and trying to get, uh, get that right. Next slide. So the challenges we kind of see here is uh, obviously the, the rebalance to the Pacific, very clear. The new normal, we're not getting out of that world in Africa, the Middle East, and that piece of there. So we're going to stay there. The readiness piece versus that wholeness piece is going to be a critical challenge that, uh, that we do that. And so the third bullet there, looking at operational global employment of our enhanced MIPTRONs. How do we take the capabilities, SECNAV touched on a little bit, joint high-speed vessel, not part of the MIPTRON, but in, you know, that type of capability, our MLPs, MLP, AFSB, LMSR, TAKE, all those ships, how do we maximize their capabilities? Maximize their capabilities in support of the ARGMU, maximize their capabilities in support of fleet operations. Some of it may even be independent operations, looking at what the mission set is and where they need to go. A lot of tremendous capabilities here uh, in these ships, and we're looking at it, trying to get after that right now on how we maximize that capability. And then... Uh, Again, the aging fleet kind of keep the sheep, uh, ships we've got right now going until we get the new ships coming online, along with the same uh, time we've got the budget uh, pressures that we've got. Next and last slide. So the piece I would end with is a, it's a ch certainly a challenging fiscal time, no question about that. But I think we're on a right path with a lot of this. Uh, the challenges we've got up here is looking at what we've got in 14, uh, trying to see what's been appropriate, how that all falls out. We've got uh, Palm 15 that's kind of gone up. We're waiting to see what the, uh, what the decisions all are in that. At the same time, we're building up Palm 16. So very challenging trying to make all those pieces knit and tie together. Um, and therefore, I think the execution piece, whether you're at the acquisition side, whether you're at the maintenance side, the training side, uh, or at the O&M, the ONS uh, piece, trying to pull that all together into whole forces is the real challenge we have. And like Tom said, we've got some great, great sailors and some great Marines working this real hard for you up at uh, OPNEV N95. So thank you very much. Mr. President says we have about five minutes for questions, and we have a question. Hi, um, I'm Laura Seligman from Inside the Navy. Um, so in the appropriations bill unveiled last night, um, appropriators added $2.2 billion to upgrade and maintain um, seven Ticar t um, sorry, Ticonderoga-class cruisers and two amphibs um, instead of retiring them. Um, so I was wondering what is the Navy's reaction to that decision? Well, we're certainly going to take the direction from Congress and we're going to execute. <laughs> okay. Um, we, we, we've got to obviously, um, I mean, that is for seven cruisers and two of whalers, uh, LS, General Walsh's LSDs. And so we've got to work our way through it and, uh, and, and work through the direction that they provided us and how then we're going to go execute that. But Thank we're you. certainly going to drive in the direction that Congress tells us to go do that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Rowden, uh, Lee Willett from James Navy International, and I apologize for the, uh, the, the foreign language. Um, um, okay, I'm going to concentrate real hard here. 
Uh, a quick question on your interesting slide on the future surface combatant, please. Um, you talked about a, a time frame of the 2020s, I think, if I heard you correctly. And I wondered if you could give me a little bit more detail on the time frame, uh, any further details on the studies that you mentioned, and what you talked about about the affordability issue and how you're driving that down. Right, yeah. Um, that's a great question. Um, the, um, as we drive towards this ship, and nominally in my mind, I'm thinking uh, uh, working with the acquisition community and driving in the latter part of the 20s to 28 time frame, contracting for it, building it in the 30s, although that's just kind of very rough. But the, the thing that's front and center in my brain as we drive towards whatever the future surface combatant's going to be is understanding that you have to get the ship to its expected service life, and in order to do that, you've got to take care of the whole mechanical and electrical, and the weapon system has to pace the threat, has to pace it or outpace the threat. And you have to be able to do that affordably. In the past, we have had, we have retired ships before their expected service life because we couldn't affordably upgrade the combat system. We have to avoid that. And, and, and driving in now at the very leading edge, I think that we can work with our acquisition brothers and sisters. I think we can work with industry to drive a ship or ships that is going to deliver the capability that we need, is going to deliver it affordably, and much more importantly, perhaps, is getting it to its expected service life in an affordable fashion. That's how we're going to get to the fleet that we need. And, so I think that, and, and that's very, very important. The modularity of the ships, and not modularity necessarily, in the, in the sense that we have in the littoral combat ship, although that could be part of it. But certainly whether we're going to put, uh, as energy weapons comes online and we have to, uh, and we have to drive towards integrated power, um, the scalability of the ships, uh, I think are all going to be important as we drive towards this ship. So we had a warp room effort, um, and we had, uh, and we had a, a, uh, 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 an analysis, a study, uh, executed from the August to uh, the um, December time frame, N96, N95, in close conjunction with the assessments uh, organization in OPNAV, uh, in order to uh, understand what the art of the possible is with, this, with, with, with what we know now in getting these ships fielded. So that's where we are. And I'm, I'm very encouraged by where we are, and I think we're out in front of this appropriately in order to be able to get to the ships that we're going to need in the latter parts of the 20s and beyond. One more? One more from Admiral, Mr. President. Just real quick, uh, Admiral Copeland had mentioned, and sorry, Kurt Warden from Nova Power Solutions. Kurt? Admiral Copeland had mentioned uh, the interfaces for the modular systems being a key component there, and those interfaces really are the key component of future upgrades and modernization. Can you expand on what efforts you're taking to define what the interfaces are and how they will uh, kind of shape the direction that, that future modernization will take? Well, I, uh, what I can tell you is this. I can tell you that if we don't put the engineering rigor into ensuring that those interfaces are well-defined and well-understood from, from the engineering acquisition community into industry, we're not going to get to where it is we need to be. No, no doubt in my mind. And, 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 and I think as we go forward, what we owe industry is ensuring that we do have those well-defined interfaces if we're going to get what we want. And so I can't speak specifically to how we're going to go. I, 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 can't, I can't describe the roadmap necessarily along the way, but I think we have a clear and getting a clearer uh, understanding of where it is we must go in order to be able to field that capability. Great question, and, and I think we'll continue to, to move along on that. So Yeah, Tom, if I could okay. just uh, kind of adding into the, the interface piece, you know, that ties into the interfaces is, is we take a look at building new ships. Um, as we're looking at the LXR, part of the part in this a analysis of alternatives we're looking at is looking at early on designing in how you can change that ship out early on to be able to make it more open, open architecture, plug and play. So when changes are made later on in the life of the ship, it's easier to do that. Along with taking a look at the uh, the commonality across the force, are there radars that the cruisers have or destroyers have that we should be putting on amphibs? That configuration management, that commonality is a key piece of this, along with how do you get them in and out of the ship to save money that way. Okay, I think we're getting the hook, everybody. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to this great week. I look forward to... Uh, 
uh, to catching up with a lot of my old shipmates. I see many of you out there in the audience, and, uh, and I'd just like to close by saying that I am one damn proud surface warfare officer, and I always will be. Thank you very much. All right, 10 minute break. Uh, please be in your seats at 10 minutes after four. Uh, CNO is expected at 1615. Thank you. <laughs>